What is up guys, I'm Kyle at Fortune. Today we're talking about the top five budget 4x4s. So I meet and talk with a ton of people that aren't into off-roading for one common purpose and usually that is a tight budget. So the whole point of my channel since the beginning was really just celebrating a life in the States or maybe somewhere else where there's a lot of people that aren't just living paycheck to paycheck, but we actually have an opportunity to use our money for a lot of extracurricular stuff. So in this case, off-roading. I don't need these trucks to get to work. I don't need them for survival, for hunting, anything like that. It's just a bunch of toys. So we are super blessed to have that. And in the States, we still have a lot of people that are on really tight budgets. And a lot of them feel like they're unable to participate in this sport or this hobby because their budget is so tight. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about five four by fours that I think are a great way to get into this. And the reason why I selected these vehicles is because for the most part, they have all the things on them in stock form to where you can wheel them as their stock or you can start upgrading them and really you can do it without having to do an axle swap or an engine swap or anything big like that and you can enjoy this vehicle from the initial purchase all the way up to building it into some crazy rock crawler if that's what you want to do so keep in mind the vehicles on this list are not something that you're going to want to be a daily driver you're going to want to take overlanding or even on your hunting trips although you could probably do all those things with these the primary purpose of these rigs is to get something on a budget and build it for off-roading so we're going to go through this list from number five all the way up to number one we're going to talk about first the specs for each one in their stock form so we're going to talk about the engine everything down the drivetrain to the axles then we're going to talk about the rarity as in how hard it is to find these vehicles especially on a budget after that we'll talk about what you can expect to pay for the initial purchase price and we'll end it with some pros and cons about that specific vehicle as in just owning it building it and wheeling it all right so let's get started on this list so number five on my list and this one is going to get a lot of comments i'm sure is a mid 80s square body suburban i know we're talking about off-roading and now i'm talking about a suburban even up to today that is the longest suburban that they ever made it has a ton of overhang it's definitely something that you wouldn't expect to see on the trail but you actually do uh, there's actually one guy uh, william at motor and fab he's got a youtube channel that's really good he has a really sweet square body suburban uh, he's taken the thing all over it's quite a beast uh, i'm pretty sure it's on 40 inch tires and the thing is awesome you know it's, what's really cool about it is it also still kind of looks like just a regular suburban it's not really cut up too bad doesn't have a ton of body damage and the thing's awesome so let's talk specs on these suburbans a lot of them came with the 350 V8, but they also had some 454s and some diesel options. So those are all things you could look for. Then they put those down into a turbo uh, 350. Some of them had a turbo 400. After 1979, the Suburban actually changed from a Dana 44 to a 10 volt front axle, which is pretty comparable. And then in the back, they had the 14 volt full float in the three quarter tons. I think in 1987, around there, is when they switched the rear to a semi-float 14 bolt, but it's still a pretty strong axle. When it comes to rarity, they made a ton of these things, and you see a lot of them floating around out there. If you get on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace and look for Suburban with that year range, or if you just lower the price down to whatever your budget is, you're gonna find a bunch of these. So talking about the price, it's all over the place, but most of them are pretty dang low. You can see these anywhere from about a thousand dollars maybe up to about five thousand if somebody had maintained it well but i think realistically you're looking between a thousand and thirty five hundred for these suburbans so that is really awesome for an initial purchase price there's a lot of people with modern 4x4s that are spending that much just on their suspension or just on their wheels and tires so think about that you're getting a whole vehicle for that same price all right so the pros of getting a suburban why in the world would i recommend a suburban for off-roading one of the biggest reasons is because it comes with that v8 so by today's standard that v8 is pretty weak but like i said 
they've got a ton of options for the 350. The aftermarket support for that engine is crazy. It's through the roof. I think that's America's favorite engine. It's definitely one of my favorites. So you can mod that thing out like crazy. Going down to the transmissions, both the 350 and the 400 are pretty strong transmissions and both have a bunch of aftermarket support once again. Transfer cases are nothing crazy in these trucks. I think all of them are chain driven, so maybe not the best. And I don't think there are any uh, lower gearing options unless you look for a doubler. The other pros are the wheelbase. I know a lot of people look at wheelbase off-roading like it's the enemy because you're going to get hung up. Uh, high centered, it's going to be harder to turn, but personally I love the long wheelbase. My ideal wheelbase is somewhere between 120 and 130 and that's crazy for a lot of people. They want something shorter like a single cab short bed pickup or Wrangler, even the four door uh, new Wranglers, I think those are around 116, but I like that long wheelbase. And if you think about it, any major obstacle that you know, it's either going down really steep or you have to climb up something and we all know when you're climbing up longer wheelbases give you much more stability sometimes your rear tire is still on the ground and your front tire is having to climb up the obstacle whereas shorter wheelbase vehicles would have to climb up all four tires at the same time it's much harder and when it comes to turning around obstacles or getting high centered it's about armor Get that armor on there, get those big rock sliders, the kick outs if you need them, and you can just use those to pivot around obstacles. So I love long wheelbase vehicles, which is kind of funny because I currently have a stock wheelbase Samurai and a stock wheelbase YJ, so they're both very short. But if you don't think I've thought about stretching those, you'd be wrong. All right, so let's get into the cons of the Suburban. Obviously, it's that same thing. It is a huge truck, right? The wheelbase is very long, so you can get hung up on a lot of stuff, especially if it's in its stock form where you don't have a lot of lift on it. Another, just by looking at them, you can see that rear overhang is crazy. Ton of rear overhang. So you're gonna have to have some type of armor back there. I've seen some guys even chop a lot of that off just so they're not hitting stuff when they come down. That same 350 that I love and a lot of other people enjoy having, if you're in California, it might be hard to pass smog with that. That is a big issue because you want to be able to drive this truck on the road to get to the trail. It's a little bit too big to be towing around. To tow that, you would need you know, a pretty big trailer and a big truck to be pulling something. And that brings me to my next con, which is the weight. These things are very heavy. They're American made. They've got really thick steel for body panels and that comes with a price. They're heavy. We all know off-road heavy is usually not your friend. It's going to require your tires to get a better grip to climb up anything. And it's going to be harder on all those parts. I actually have a 97 Suburban. So this is the next generation and it was stretched a little bit. So we're probably at about 132 inches of wheelbase. So a little bit over what I would recommend, but it was on 14 volt Dana 60 and 37s. Absolutely loved it. So uh, if you guys think I'm crazy for recommending that, Maybe you're right, but if you've seen my Suburban wheel, it did awesome. Got a lot of attention on the trail. And also it's kind of like being the underdog. A lot of people said, you're not gonna make it, it's too big. You're gonna get a ton of body damage. We'd see him up at the top of the trail. Not only did I make it, got no body damage and did mostly obstacles easier than them because of that long wheelbase. All right, next on the list, number four. This is the YJ Jeep. That's right, it is on the list. Um, I think a lot of people probably would put it a little bit higher, but we'll get into the reason why I have got it a little bit lower on my list. These YJs were made between 87 and 95, I believe. It's somewhere in that range. Uh, these are nicknamed the Yuppie Jeep. A uh, lot of weird stuff happened after the CJ. The CJ Jeep was a little Jeep that everybody loved, and they tried to make it a little bit more modern with the YJ, and it, it kind of turned into more of a car than the CJ was in my opinion and uh, came out with square headlights. So there's a lot of things that turned people off from it but the YJ was my first vehicle I ever had for off-roading and so you know I kind of have a love for it because of that but I really do think that it is a great budget 4x4. Four four. Uh, we'll get into why here in a second. So let's talk about the specs. The specs for the YJ are actually pretty decent. There were a few different options you could get. The one I would look for is the 4.0 liter found in the later years. Then if you go to the manual transmission, you'll get an AX15, which I think is a pretty stout transmission for that package, as long as you don't go up too much in power 
or, you know, or too much and tire. Uh, I think the AX15 is great if you were going to have the automatic, it'd be a TF999, which I had in my Wrangler, and probably not the best automatic, so I would stick with the manual. That goes back into an MP231, which is a pretty popular transfer case. Uh, later on, you can find those with 4 to 1. I think they discontinued most of the 4 to 1 kits for the YJ era 231, so it might be a little bit hard to find that lower gearing option for the transfer case but then it goes down into a Dana 35 rear and a Dana 30 front. For these, I would stay away from the 2.5 liter four cylinder just because it is a four cylinder. It has a weaker transmission. I think it was an AX5. It's a small engine pushing something that's almost the same weight as the 4.0 liter and the 4.0 liter is a really famous engine. You guys love it. I've got one of my YJ. It's got 140,000 miles on it and it does great. Right, so let's talk rarity. Uh, I think there's a ton of these out there. When you search on Marketplace or Craigslist, you will find some. It's not a ton because people tend to hang on to their Jeeps. Uh, even the YJs, it seems like in my area, people aren't really selling them. And it's also the summertime right now. We're just about to hit fall. So this is like the worst time to buy an off-road vehicle because these people all want to keep them for wheeling in the summer. It's the winter time when they kind of think about getting rid of those usually. So uh, let's talk about the price. Jeeps really hold on to their value. They're usually pretty expensive to buy new and then they hold on to that value for whatever reason, even the YJs. So I'd say price wise, depending on condition, of course, you're looking at anywhere between about 4,500 to 6,000, somewhere in that range is uh, probably a good condition YJ to get started with. If it's in stock form, has more miles on it, maybe a little bit of body damage or one of the lesser desirable trims like the base model or maybe even like the Renegade, uh, you can get it for a little bit cheaper. I actually picked one up recently, it was a really good deal. Um, I think back probably 10 years ago, I bought one for 2,500, oh no, it was 3,500 bucks and it already had some good mods on it. So I think there is a little bit of wiggle room there. Uh, you just need to get out and talk with the people. Let's talk about pros and cons. So the pros of the Jeep are, number one, it's a Jeep. And the first thing that sticks out in my mind about Jeeps is the aftermarket support. I didn't own a Jeep before getting this one recently. I still got the Quadratech, four-wheel parts, four-wheel drive, catalog, all that, just because they're fun to look at, you know, some reading material. And there's just so many options. You can customize these things like crazy. You need to have very little mechanical knowledge to do it. Most of the stuff they offer for these things is bolt on you, so you don't need to know how to like weld or cut or fabricate any metal. You can really just unbolt something and put something on. So I'd say ease of use and upgrading Jeep is probably on the top of the list. And that's why it made this list for me. You can take the doors off, you can take the top off. It's got that short wheelbase so you can maneuver between obstacles fairly well. Uh, they're not as heavier as some of the other trucks. They have very simple leaf spring construction where uh, you don't have to worry about links or coils. It's basically just a leaf spring holds that axle in place and you get the option of, do you want to put the spring from spring under on top, the spring over they call it. It'll give you about five and a half, six inches of lift, or you can just get a bigger lift spring that is going to lift it spring under. So for the most part, it's pretty easy to work with the YJ. I love the 4.0 engine and I personally think it's a good looking Jeep, even with the square headlights and that angled grille. All right, so cons. This YJ does have a fair amount of cons in my opinion, and that's why it's only number four on this list. One of the biggest issues I have with the YJ is that they're starting to get a little bit older now to where they're also having trouble passing smog. So mine is in that same boat. I'm trying to get it to pass smog right now. And this is just before the OBD2 where you could plug something in, which I believe started in 96. My Jeep's in 93 and it's a little bit harder to troubleshoot these things so i'm kind of going through it the old-fashioned way also for the yj the leaf springs ride really poorly on a road uh, the best you're going to find is those stock springs for sure but once you start upgrading their spring under they really uh, just don't articulate well at all which also leads to a poor ride off-road and really bad flex off-road so you have to get creative with those things or you have to pay a fair amount of money to get lift kits that are going to be able to ride and flex well off-road. Another con is the short wheelbase. It's a little bit difficult to stretch the YJ just because the gas tank is in the back. And I think in stock form with the Dana 35, you really only have about 
two and a half, maybe maybe three inches, uh, depending on uh, your specific configuration. Once you get to a bigger axle like a Dana 44 or uh, maybe an 8.8, .8, you lose a lot of that ability to stretch it more without moving the gas tank. That brings me to the final con of the YJ is the axles and it's the biggest reason why I wouldn't get it because we're talking about buying this vehicle for a budget, building it and wheeling it through the years. You want to be able to wheel it immediately, at least I do. And with the Dana 35 and the 30, they are good axles. I think once you build them, you can get up to um, probably a 33 inch tires, but in their stock form, I would not push it with those. They are just gonna give you a ton of problems off-road. And in my opinion, they're toothpicks. So I, I wouldn't even pick up a Jeep if it had those on them. But if you're just starting out and you're on a budget, it might work for you. All right, next on the list, number three, this is the 79 to about 85 Toyota pickup. That's right, it's the Toyota pickup. It's not the Toyota Tacoma. This is before all that stuff happened. The year range for me is very specific. I've never owned one of these pickups, um, but I definitely would love to. Uh, I think they can get built in some really cool trucks and a lot of people just like that generation of Toyotas. In 85, I believe, was when they had the last year of the solid front axle, which is key. Yeah, that's what you want. And then I think 85 is also when the EFI came out, so it was a huge upgrade. So if you're gonna be looking for one of these, you want the 85, that's the gem. But there aren't a lot of cons to getting getting a pickup before that. So definitely look for them, 79 to 85. I would love to have one. Let's talk about specs. Um, the, probably one of the most popular Toyota truck engines out there is 22R and the 22 RE. People love these engines. I think the only difference really between those two engines is uh, one of them does have some fuel injection, some more modern stuff, but even with the 22 R, I wouldn't mind having it. It might be cool to even swap it to propane if you're having any issues with that uh, fuel delivery. All right, after that, they have a uh, pretty solid transmission. I haven't heard about a ton of problems with those, but really the cool thing about these Toyotas, in my opinion, is the transfer case and transfer case options. You can get some really cool options in these. You can double them up, um, get insanely low crawl ratios that make that engine not a factor. You can just crawl through all kinds of stuff. Getting down to the axles, these are some of my favorite axles. I actually have a set that I'm going to swap into the Samurai eventually because these Toyota 8-inch axles are really unusually strong for how small they are. Uh, I've seen people run 40-inch tires off these once they upgrade them, so you know that's pretty cool to be able to run a tire that big and not have a lot of breakage and it's the same axle that you had when the vehicle is stock. But let's talk about rarity. Yeah, these are getting kind of old now. These are some of the oldest on my list and they are getting harder to find, but they're still out there. And just like anything else, it's all about the condition of the vehicle uh, is what you're gonna pay. But Toyotas are really known for keeping their value. And the cool thing is a lot of these have like 250,000 miles on them and they're still running great. So, you know, this is one of those where the mileage doesn't really have to deter you from buying it just because it has a lot. You can rebuild that engine. All right, so for price, I would say um, somewhere between about 3,500 all the way up to 6,000 for somebody who's taken really good care of it. But, you know, if anyone's wheeling these, they might have some body damage or maybe a little bit of rust or, you know, replace fenders that don't match, something like that which I think are easy things to fix, especially if it's just your off-roader. Definitely on the higher part of the purchase price, parts availability, I think, and the reliability of this truck make up for that. Continuing with the pros. The thing about these trucks are they are just cool. All the way back to Back to the Future, looking at these trucks, I mean, I think that's where a lot of people fell in love with the Toyota pickup. It was Marty McFly's like dream truck, and for a lot of other people, these Toyotas and this body style have been their dream as well. So uh, for me, what I would like to see with one of these is get them pushed up to about 37 inch tires. Uh, not a lot of mods to the axles to be able to handle that. Get some low gearing in there. They have so many crazy gearing options and, and that is the biggest selling point to me. Um, it's already got the engine and the transmission and the transfer case. So now you just need to reconfigure it to get that gearing out of it. There's a lot of information online about these. I like how long the wheelbase is. 
They are relatively light compared to the other trucks on the trail, and they're pretty skinny too. So if someday you wanted to swap out to full-size axles, I mean, you could really create a monster out of these. Uh, lastly, those engines are so small, uh, you don't really have to worry about destroying your drivetrain like you would if you had a V8 or something. So um, you can be under-engined and over-axle, as the dirt everyday guys say. That way, you know, you can really hit it hard and you don't really have to worry about breaking those parts. All right, so let's talk about cons. Uh, the cons are mostly that purchase price. I, I think people kind of jack these prices up. And also, for whatever reason, people really like to get their hands on these trucks and try to do their own fabrication. And uh, it can get pretty ugly. Uh, one of the reasons why people cut these up so much is because it does take a lot of cutting or a lot of lift or both together to get some big tires on them. So you'll see guys with just giant leaf springs and these huge shackles and you know a lot of really weird configurations that might not be the best design uh, to get those big tires on there. So I think that's the, the biggest struggle for me if I was to get one of these Toyotas is to figure out how am I gonna get these big tires in there to where they can actually flex. But uh, it's number three on my list because I don't think there are a lot of cons to it and I think it's an awesome truck to have. All right, number two on my list. We are getting to the top now. This is one of the coolest trucks I've ever owned. For me, I feel like this is a truck that just fits me perfectly. I really love the truck. Uh, I'd love to have another one someday. Uh, we're getting quite the, the dealership parking lot over at my house, so we can't really do it right now, but this is the M1008. A lot of people don't know what this is to the untrained eye. It might just look like a regular mid 80s Chevy K30, but it's not. It's a military variant of one of those K30s. They actually refer to them as five quarter tons or one and a quarter ton trucks. Super heavy duty. Um, they were made for the military to use and they have a ton of pros to having one. I think they are just the coolest truck. These trucks all came with the 6.2 liter diesel, uh, went into a turbo 400. I think it was an MP208. Um, either way, it's an okay transfer case, but this is where it gets cool. It goes down into a full float 14 bolt rear axle. This came stock with these trucks. Inside that axle, it had a gov lock, which is similar to a Detroit locker, and had 456 gears. Even with the stock tires, that's what these guys were running. Then on the front axle end, it comes with a Dana 60 axle with an open differential, but 456 gears. And I mean, it's one ton. This thing is ready to rock. Rarity is pretty high up there though. They, they are getting really hard to find. I search for them every once in a while just to see if I can find one that's maybe pretty beat up. Even with that, they go pretty fast. They usually come from auctions or some guy will buy it from an auction really cheap and you know get it to where it's running a little bit. Now it can drive and then they'll hike that price up and sell it. Price wise, I bought one for about 3,500 that was kind of in the middle of the grading area and then you know quickly fixed some stuff and had an awesome truck. But these get expensive. The nicer they are, uh, they can go all the way up to probably like $10,000 um, just because of so many cool factors in them. Uh, I think that is like the biggest selling point is to have one ton axles, heavy duty transmission, a pretty heavy duty engine, and really all you gotta do is lift it, fix some steering, and cut out maybe a little bit of sheet metal to fit some tires. I was running 37s on mine, uh, which were surplus Humvee tires. And that gets me to the next point of the cool factor of these things. They are military vehicles. Guys had used them back in the 80s and they're just now starting to get rid of them everywhere. I've seen a bunch on military bases and they are awesome. You know these have been out there putting in work with the military. They've had all kinds of different roles. They've, they've had some that were an ambulance, some that are like radio trucks, some of them were personnel movers. And I think the most common variant is kind of like a tug which is why they were all geared so low with those 456s. But another cool thing about that gearing is you can put, say, a six inch lift on them and then those 37s, and now you're geared exactly where you need to be. That, that diesel engine I had, man, when I, even on 37s, I was getting like 20 miles per gallon driving that thing around. I had one that was straight piped. It was a ton of fun. It was just an old tractor, you know, and, and people are just like, good God, looking at me driving down that road. This big old camo truck on Humvee tires, straight piped, just roaring away. I absolutely loved it, if you can't tell. The best part, though, 
in the end, especially for us out in California, is that this is just the right year of diesel where it doesn't have to be smogged. Uh, so, you know, that's something that can be very advantageous when you go to sell it in the state of California. You could really sell it and people just buy it for the VIN and, and the chassis because you could swap another engine in there that is totally illegal. Uh, I definitely would not consider doing that because that is wrong. When I sold mine, I, I have a feeling that's why the guys wanted it. They wanted the VIN number saying that it didn't need to get smogged and they were going to turn that thing into some kind of monster, which once again is very wrong. Okay, cons. Like anything, there are some cons to these trucks. Uh, the first being, uh, there is not a lot of aftermarket support for these. So if you're going to look into building this into uh, a rock crawler, you know, a, a big trail truck, a lot of the stuff you might have to fabricate yourself as far as bumpers, rear bumpers, rock sliders, any type of armor underneath the truck. And then that diesel engine, in my opinion, is great. But the one thing that sucks about it is it runs on a 24 volt system, which is a little bit unusual. And then when mine blew up, I was talking to some diesel shops. Nobody wants to touch it. They always use the excuse that it is too costly to rebuild it or replace it uh, with another one that you might as well just put another diesel engine in there. So it tells you how expensive it is to do that. But as long as your engine's in good shape, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Another is the sheer weight of these trucks. When you go to register them, it is quite a bit more than the same trucks and it's in that body style and everything. Um, I considered taking the bed off and, you know, trying to lighten it up to get it into that next bracket down, but I never did. So it costs a fair amount to register these, at least in California. Uh, along with that weight, they are heavy. It's a big truck getting it through the trail. Um, even though the like we talked about with the Suburban, you know, these are some very solid trucks as far as the body goes, but they can still take a lot of damage like anything else. Lastly, with the cons, I would say the biggest one is the price because they just get so expensive and it is really like a, a specialty truck. Like you kind of have to know what you're doing to work with these, but um, they have the manuals out there. There's forums. I think it's called Steel Soldiers. You can go read about a bunch of these. Man, close to number one on my list, but uh, th there's just a couple things that are holding it back too much for me for it to be number one. All right, guys, number one on the list. Um, I'm sure a lot of people saw this coming that actually follow this channel or know me. Yeah, I, I just cannot get around the value of this vehicle if you're on a budget like I am. And that is the Suzuki Samurai. Uh, when I was a Jeep guy in the beginning, I kind of looked down on these Samurais. I thought they were just really small, uh, foreign, really easily dented. You know, a lot of them look like they were not built very well as far as the actual off-road build goes. And I just didn't like them. Later in life, a friend of mine was going to buy one. Um, and I tell him, okay, yeah, if you buy it, I'll help you build it. He buys it. And then I say, okay, well, here's the list of all the parts I would buy. And when I was doing my research, for the parts, I couldn't believe how cheap they are. I'm guessing it just has to do with the, the small amount of metal that goes into these things. Um, I'd say it costs about half as much as building a Jeep, which is insane. So if you're on a budget, that is a serious reason to consider one of these Samurais. But I would look for that 1.3 liter, um, I think they were all manual transmissions. They go into the Samurai transfer case, which has a ton of options available for it. And then it goes down into the Samurai axles, which pretty much are just like miniature Toyota axles. So um, they are very strong for their size, but they do have some serious limitations, which we'll talk about. Okay, rarity. I think they are starting to get pretty rare. Um, I've probably only seen two on the street uh, in recent memory. I picked one up for, I think it was 22, might've been 2,500, I don't remember, but it was a really great deal. I mean, that's like, really nothing to pay. Mine was in pretty good condition. Uh, came with a full roll cage and some bucket seats too. So I think for price, a uh, reasonable amount to pay for one of these would be somewhere between 1500 and maybe 3500 So So pretty low down on our scale, um, probably only second to what you could get one of the Suburbans for, but th that price is great. Okay, so let's talk about the pros and cons. This thing has a ton of pros. The number one being the budget. I mean, you can build these things for so cheap. It's really crazy. I mean, 
um, buying them for so cheap and then just working on these axles and stuff, the lockers, everything is so cheap. You can build a really capable off-road truck without doing a whole lot to these. And once again, because they're the leaf spring suspension, I mean, you can just do a spring over like I did. That got me about five inches of lift and then I could run 31s. And it's funny because 31 is a really small tire compared to what all the other trucks are running. But if you think about it, the Samurai is really just a scaled down version of like a Jeep, right? So 31s on a Samurai is like 33s or 35s on a, a YJ. That same breakover angle, except another thing you're getting out of it is a super lightweight vehicle. I mean, I'd say mine is around 2,500 pounds stock. I think they're like 2,200 pounds. So you can have a really light crawler that doesn't need a ton of traction to get up a lot of stuff. Another huge pro to the Samurai, and one of the reasons why I bought one for myself, I saw a video of a Samurai crawling, and I'm like, how'd they get so much crawl ratio out of that thing? Turns out you can get gearing in your transfer case with like a ton of different options. Uh, the lowest one I believe is six and a half to one, which is nuts. Think about the Jeep Rubicon, it's got a four to one. Um, the only people that really have anything lower than that are the guys running these really expensive transfer cases, you know, that are pushing $3,000. Uh, we can do that in the Samurai with a 6.4 or 6.5 to one. And you can either buy a transfer case that already has that in there for less than $1,500 or you can buy the gear set, which I think is around five or $600 to do it yourself. And that kind of crawl ratio for the, the buck, I think is unbeatable. They get really good mileage compared to all the other vehicles in this class. And honestly, this has been the most fun I've ever had working on one because they're super easy to work on and driving. Um, they're so skinny that you can really pick lines where on the other vehicles they have no option they just drive up it you've got to go straight up the trail and uh, maybe you can go to the side a little bit the samurai can literally go in between these obstacles and then turning obviously is uh, really good you can just make some super sharp turns i absolutely love the samurai for a budget i think it just can't be beat but let's get into the cons because it does have some serious cons too um, the biggest one for me was, once again in California, the smog. The, mine's an 86, so it, it's quite a bit older now. It's pushing 35 years, and, you know, the engine is just not up to passing smog. So I had a very hard time doing that. I recently converted it over to propane, and that does uh, very well. I'm not sure how the smog's going to work on that. I'm still figuring it out. So I would like to drive it on the road, it's a lot of fun. Going back to that engine, I did have a lot of issues with the carburetor. Um, I had an aftermarket Weber carburetor and it was horrible for off-road. I had a really hard time with it. Swapping a propane, killed all that, it works really well. Now I have no excuses. Every time I stall it out, it's totally my fault. Going down to working on those axles, um, super easy. Even when these things are rusted out and have damage on them, they're still super easy to work on. Uh, very easy to you know have a small amount of tools needed to tear these apart compared to a, an American made vehicle. All right another con is without doing an axle swap you are very limited to what the stock axles can do. Right when I got mine I put the chromoly shafts in the back, upgraded the front from 22 to 26 spline chromolys and even with that I think it's pretty common knowledge that uh, if you're locked and wheeling on high traction surfaces like rocks, that you're not going to want to go over a 31 or else you are going to run to reliability issues, breaking shafts and things like that. I'd say you could probably get up to about 33 maybe, depending on how easy you are on the truck and also what you have in that differential. If it's a selectable, you can turn it off. Or if it's just open, you'd probably have a much uh, more reliable package out of that. The last part of the cons, and I, I don't think it's a huge one, but it's definitely a factor, is how small everything is. What is also a pro is a con because the sheet metal on the whole body is very easily dented. I mean, you can lean on these things the wrong way and put a dent in it. Because it's so thin, anywhere where you might have some rust is pretty much ruined. It's hard to replace it because it is so thin. Um, but, you know, honestly, that's it for the cons, and that's why it's at number one.
All right, so that is my list of budget wheelers. If you notice, they all kind of were in the same category as far as price. Um, year range was very similar for them. They're all on leaf spring suspension. And, you know, I just love the simplicity of them. That, that's really what does it for me. Um, you don't have to worry about the geometry of building any links. There's any fancy computer systems to work with. There's a lot of knowledge out there on most of the trucks besides them 1008, but still um, there's a good amount of information about that one too. So obviously I didn't hit a lot of vehicles that you guys own or love. If you came up with something else, put it down in the comments and let me know what it is. I'd love to hear your ideas. A lot of people keep their vehicles for you know their whole life or for a really long time. I kind of like to move around with vehicles just because I like building and exploring these other ones. I talked about how I haven't owned that Toyota pickup, but I would like to. So it's always something I'm on the lookout for. I'd love to get one. Uh, it's been a lot of fun just thinking about this. I'm always thinking about these different vehicles. And when I get bored, I'll search Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, or the forums and try to find one for really cheap that I can snag, um, bring it home, beg forgiveness for my wife and then start building it. I've had a lot of fun putting this list together. I hope you enjoyed watching it. Don't forget to put something down in the comments if I forgot it or if I messed up one of the specs on the trucks. If you want to see more and see me wheel the Samurai, the YJ, or the Colorado, definitely subscribe to see when those videos come out. Thanks for watching. See you next time.